what I thought I would do is in about, uh, uh, in hopefully in about 15, 20 minutes, take you through uh, some of our considerations for uh, vaccine development, just as a, a thought starter, perhaps uh, for questions, I know. And uh, just, I, I wanted to start by just saying that when I think about vaccines today at FDA, I start from the place of really wanting to think about vaccine confidence. What we do at FDA is we, our job is actually to determine whether vaccines are safe and effective. But I would not be doing my job well if I didn't start by saying that ultimately that is hopefully supporting confidence in uh, the vaccines that we approve. Um, that confidence is so important um, because the way we have had the incredible public health successes over the past century, elimination of smallpox, um, essentially elimination from polio from our country, and the near elimination of measles, with the exception of imported cases, um, is because of high levels of vaccination. And um, unfortunately, when uh, conspiracy theories and other things about vaccines tend to proliferate or misinformation about vaccines, um, it can really cause issues. I, I put this slide up here, um, uh, which is uh, from uh, something that was published from Peter Hotez and, and, and Dr. Marsh from New York Times in, uh, in January, just to show that you know, there's, there's the reality, for instance, with measles. Um, the reality is right now that a lot of people say, well, why do we need to vaccinate our kids against measles? It's not such a bad disease, maybe. Well, that's because they don't really realize anymore that it is kind of a bad disease. Um, and that um, if you look um, at the boxes here, you'll see that um, you actually end up with a fair number of hospitalizations and um, you end up in a developed country or a high income country um, with you know 10 to 30 deaths per uh, 10,000. But if you look at, for instance, at the measles outbreak that they had in Samoa, a lower middle income country, um, 146 deaths per 10,000. So really just to, to show you that that's what the downs, you know, this is what uh, can happen with measles and what's there in terms of side effects from the vaccine. Well, it's pretty well been uh, debunked that the uh, measles, mumps, rubella vaccine causes autism. Um, and if you look at the other side effects, they're relatively, relatively modest. It's not like there are no side effects, but they're modest in comparison to death. Um, and so we think about vaccine confidence as, as something that we really have to think about. And that's why I think for this particular vaccine, in this case of COVID-19, in this particular environment that we are in right now, because I think we all, I, I, you, you guys know better than, than I do, and you could probably give me a seminar on the issues of conspiracy theories and, and other things going on in our country right now. We need to make sure that we do our best um, to take anyone who might be on the fence about taking a vaccine and helping them over that fence. Um, I don't know whether we'll be able to get the people that are, that are really, really clinging to um, uh, to not believing the vaccines work, but we need to try to, to get as many people on board with the vaccine. So this is just the same uh, type of a plot for influenza, again, showing that influenza, and this is seasonal influenza, is associated with deaths. And the flu vaccine um, is, it, there are some adverse effects. For instance, there is probably a slight increased risk of Guillain-Barre syndrome, a paralyzing syndrome when you get the um, flu vaccine in some years. Um, that's also something that can happen with flu itself. Um, but again, uh, something to just balance benefits and risks. So the major uh, COVID-19 vaccine target happens to be this big protein that sits on the outside surface of the virus. It's denoted here by these big red triangles. Um, it's the spike protein. You guys probably know more about that than um, I would at this point. Um, practically, uh, you've been reporting on it. Um, there are other proteins as well. The one that's probably worthwhile knowing about also is the N protein or nucleoprotein. Um, the reason for that is you may hear about the fact that most vaccines are being uh, developed against the spike protein. 
Um, I, one of the nice things about uh, some of the assays that have been developed is one can measure uh, antibodies against spike protein and antibodies against nucleoprotein. Um, the antibodies uh, actually are helpful to have together because ultimately we should be able to figure out if uh, a spike protein uh, uh, vaccine uh, is uh, deployed, we should be able to figure out who's naturally immune um, who will have antibodies against both S and N and potentially other proteins uh, versus those who have antibodies against the, um, uh, the S protein. Um, obviously, that's if one is using a, a, an S protein-based vaccine and not some whole killed virus vaccine. So that brings me into this discussion of our vaccine approaches. Um, so uh, across the globe, there are well over 100 development programs now uh, for vaccines. Um, the WHO keeps an updated list. Um, uh, many of them are preclinical. Um, uh, some have moved into uh, phase one, uh, and some are now advancing into phase uh, three trials. Uh, they range the uh, gamut from uh, nucleic acid-based vaccines, such as DNA or RNA-based vaccines, to protein subunit vaccines, making the S protein and potentially giving it either alone or with an adjuvant. Inactivated virus vaccines, um, uh, basically taking the whole virus and then using uh, something like formalin uh, or another inactivating agent so that one has the antigens uh, and giving that. Um, uh, Non-replicating viral vectors, expressing the uh, protein in a, in a virus that can uh, lead to expression on the cell surface and development of a, an immune response. Replicating viral vectors, um, uh, replicating viral vectors, an example of a replicating viral vector um, happens to be the measles vaccine or uh, the recent Ebola uh, vaccine that was um, uh, approved. Um, they actually are vaccines that uh, produce the protein but also um, replicate and so one can give lower amounts. Live attenuated viruses, which um, take a while to develop, and virus-like particles, um, some of which might be made even in uh, plants. So when we think about vaccine uh, development, the general considerations, we have to think about manufacturing quality. Generally, for biologics, the quality of manufacturing and the safety and efficacy of a product are inextricably linked. If something is not well manufactured, its safety and uh, efficacy are generally um, suboptimal. Um, and we also have to think about the fact that for vaccines, um, which will be given, uh, particularly in this COVID-19 time, um, we may not have long-term follow-up on, on people. So we may know that something is uh, safe and efficacious in the short term, but we wanna make sure that as larger populations are treated for longer periods of time, there are no new safety concerns that might emerge. And so post-market surveillance becomes an issue. So what kinds of things do we think about? For consistency of manufacturing, we think about the need for manufacturing processes and controls, uh, including um, uh, the, uh, basically what you need to make sure you're consistently uh, manufacturing something as you scale it up. Um, we wanna make sure that the facilities that are making vaccines are inspected so they meet our standards um, uh, uh, for good manufacturing practices. In terms of safety, we need to, particularly for these COVID-19 vaccines, make sure there's not type of, any type of immune enhancement of disease. That's because some similar viruses have been associated with this, at least in animal models. Um, uh, and uh, there's also this need to make sure that we have a large enough safety database um, so that we're not surprised uh, when we go into a really large population. Um, and so generally, um, that's been a, a safety database of at least 3,000 people, but that we, we, we actually would say uh, larger than that might be a good thing uh, when you're thinking about going from um, trials in tens of thousands of people to administration in tens to hundreds of millions of people. Um, there is the uh, evaluation of efficacy, um, where in the case of COVID-19, um, we're thinking about the need for a clinical disease endpoint efficacy study because we still don't really know whether the immune response that one produces um, when one gets uh, COVID-19, whether that really, uh, how long that protects, 
what what will the will the vaccine that one gives produce an immune response that mirrors uh, that natural immune response. So um, for the first vaccines that come along, they'll probably need clinical disease endpoint studies. And we also want to think about um, what the criteria would be um, to prevent us from accepting an ineffective vaccine. And I'll say more about that. So we put out a guidance in June. Uh, the link is here to that guidance. Um, uh, this, this guidance was put together by our Office of Vaccines together with some of our policy people. Um, and uh, it goes over the various aspects of uh, putting together a COVID-19 vaccine, everything from the chemistry manufacturing controls, the preclinical or non-clinical data that one needs, what we expect from clinical trials, what we expect once it's on the market or authorized in terms of post uh, licensure safety evaluation or post authorization safety evaluation, uh, aspects of di uh, diagnostic and serologic assays and um, some additional considerations. So. For us, kind of the key considerations here um, are that uh, the non-clinical studies in animal models have to uh, support um, the development of these vaccines, including the dose, dosing regimen, and how they're being given. Um, we need um, uh, to think about, um, we need to think about uh, the uh, extent of non-clinical data that we need to support our first in human trials, which can vary from vaccine to vaccine, depending on the experience that we have. Um, in terms of clinical data, we have to think about um, what we have and what we don't have, which is that right now we don't have very much to say that if we have an immune correlate um, with these uh, vaccines or an immune response with these vaccines, that we can correlate that to a clinical endpoint. We need to get those immune correlates of protection. Um, and that will come from the first few vaccines. Uh, it's hoped that after the first few vaccines reach market, we'll understand the relationship between the efficacy we see clinically and the immune responses. Um, does that mean that unfortunately, the first that are coming along will probably have to go through more work to get there? It probably does, um, uh, but, um, that's just the nature of, of vaccine development. Um, uh, we are trying to do what we can to uh, expedite clinical development programs through adaptive or seamless clinical trial designs. Um, and we also note that we're, uh, we'll need an adequate body of data to make sure that there aren't things like uh, enhanced respiratory disease or, or uh, antibody dependent enhanced disease. Um, so we talk about the fact probably the most important thing from this slide is that our goal is to say that in these trials, we need a cross-section of the population that is ultimately going to be treated enrolled. Um, and that means that um, the trials will need to enroll thousands of patients. They're going to need to enroll people who have a variety of medical comorbidities. Um, they're going to have to en enroll a diverse population, including racial and ethnic minorities, because we need to make sure that um, the vaccine is able to be deployed and to be effective in, um, in the entire population, not just uh, the population that typically uh, it, it volunteers for clinical trials. Um, we also then have to uh, make sure that ultimately elderly individuals, we have to understand that those uh, people are adequately studied. We'll need to make sure that pregnant women and women of childbearing potential, uh, potential are not, uh, uh, are, are not uh, understudied. And ultimately, we'll have to work down towards uh, studying the vaccine in pediatric populations. How quick we'll get there will depend on uh, the vaccine development plan and the individual vaccine. Um, we're talking about the fact that early on, the, uh, there will often be trials that are done with multiple vaccine candidates, perhaps from a uh, manufacturer all in kind of the same category, but they'll then look to, to, to find the best one to take forward. Later on, um, uh, the trials, uh, the, and those, those trials don't have to be randomized, but later on, as we're dealing with uh, trials uh, for efficacy, we need to start to talk about uh, randomized controlled trials. Um, uh, and, that's, uh, and, and that's where we're talking about our randomized placebo controlled trials. Um, we also then note that if, if people are going to do adaptive design uh, tr trials, they really need to pre-specify things. Um, okay. Um, 
I'm going to ask you a favor. I'm going to, can we just pause here and we'll take that uh, five minute, uh, 10 minute break and it may only be five minutes and I will then come back and finish this and continue on with the questions and answers. I'm sorry. I'm just getting buzzed that they need me right now. This is probably one of the more important slides that um, because it's what's been talked about most uh, frequently, both here in the US and in Europe and with the um, uh, WHO. Um, we decided to break a little bit with our European colleagues on the primary efficacy endpoint and what our point estimate would be. Um, the, this question is, what do, you, what do you pick? Normally in guidance, we don't put what we think of as the uh, optimal efficacy for a vaccine. But in this case, we basically suggested that one needed to be 50% better uh, than a placebo and that the lower bound of the 95% confidence interval needed to be um, uh, at least I mean, an efficacy of 30%. Um, that has been roundly roasted from both sides. People, some people saying, well, wouldn't you accept a vaccine that had lower efficacy in some patients because, well, it could at least help some people. And on the other hand, some people said, well, wait a second, 50% is, is do you really mean that that's you know that that could probably wouldn't give you herd immunity even if you vaccinated you know 90 percent of the population well we picked that because it was a reasonable place to come out knowing that seasonal influenza on a good year um, has an efficacy of about 50 percent it's not perfect but it's something to start with it i think what it also does is it it puts a basement on things. It, it puts a floor, which is that um, that we don't want to see if, if you actually have something that had twenty or thirty percent efficacy. It means that that's that is a point estimate. That's one point in time, and it could be that the actual efficacy is is actually lower than that. And I think we just don't want to see that. Um, uh, we also told people that if they're going to be doing using these criteria, they should apply these criteria both to interim analyses, final analyses, um, and that people should make sure that they're also looking for other things like this risk of enhanced disease and futility uh, as they go about their clinical trials. Um, uh, we, we talked about general safety considerations. I've also kind of mentioned these already in terms of the entry criteria, but the general safety evaluation has to be like our other preventative vaccines. Ultimately, even if we have a, an efficacy readout after a few months, we, we would ask that all of those subjects continue to be followed um, so that we can evaluate the safety and duration of immune protection um, uh, of, of a vaccine. Now, obviously, there, that might not be possible for that entire year against placebo because if, if a vaccine is determined to be effective, uh, it may be that people cross over, but it would at least be helpful to have the population followed uh, for that time. Um, and and we, we anticipate that any of the vaccine trials that we'll see um, will have an adequate size database uh, in terms of safety. Why? Because if you do the math to get to the efficacy uh, calculation that you need to get to the power calculation, you're, you're doing trials that are generally going to have um, somewhere in the order of 10 to 15,000 patients in each arm, those getting vaccine versus that, uh, the arm getting um, a placebo. Um, post licensure, um, obviously safety considerations are very important. Um, uh, to facilitate this, we recommend early planning of pharmacovigilance. Um, that's already ongoing now. Um, uh, we want to make sure that there are systems in place so that we can uh, detect any issues that will come up early. Um, in this regard, we're in a better place now than we were even a few years ago because there are very large database systems between Sentinel and others, uh, CMS database, um, some of the uh, databases that have been put together uh, by uh, medical record companies like Epic um, that will help us uh, to do this. And obviously, we can require post-marketing studies um, or additional trials if there are any kind of uh, known or potential serious risks. Um, the two last things I'd like to kind of end on is that, you know, so we often get asked, well, could we uh, approve a vaccine on an accelerated approval basis? We do that for some vaccines when we understand the correlative protection, when we understand how 
the immune response correlates to clinical outcome. But since we don't have that now, um, for the first vaccines that come through, as I mentioned earlier, we don't expect uh, to be using our accelerated approval uh, provisions because we don't think we'll have enough knowledge uh, to correlate the immune response to the clinical outcome. Regarding the other thing that we could do in terms of getting availability sooner, um, it is possible that we could issue an emergency use authorization uh, once studies have demonstrated the safety and effectiveness of the vaccine, um, but before uh, a manufacturer has submitted um, or the FDA has completed its formal review of a biologics license application. This is an area where I think that I'm sure you'll have some questions because the question is how, what do you really mean here? How, how, what amount of data do you need? And I think we really optimally would like to see the data that from a trial that's reached its efficacy endpoint. In other words, at an interim analysis or at a final analysis, it's, it's met the statistical uh, uh, boundary. Um, it's, it's, it's met the endpoint. Uh, and that um, the DSMB, the Data Safety Monitoring Board, agrees with that. And at that point, it can usually take several months before a, a, a trial is formatted and given over to FDA for review and as part of a biologics license application. In this case, what we want to do is shorten that time very significantly, potentially, um, uh, by not requiring um, the same uh, formatting into the application for a biologics license application and the meetings and everything else that would go with it for the review, but, but potentially by reviewing those data, confirming things out, and then potentially um, uh, having an emergency use authorization. We don't, though, intend, have any intention of using emergency use authorization to take a vaccine of suboptimal effect or an unproven vaccine um, to uh, bring it uh, forward. That's just, that would be doing such a disservice here. Um, people need to feel confidence. And um, the final thing I'll just uh, say here, um, you know, we've been, uh, we've been trying to be highly responsive to the sponsors regarding vaccine development plans. We are using expedited review times for submissions. We're talking with our regulatory counterpart points, uh, counterparts globally. Um, to try to have uh, regulatory convergence here. Um, and we are willing to shorten our vaccine development timelines, but they can't compromise safety and uh, efficacy standards. It simply can't do that because that goes back to my first slide, which is that if we don't have a process whereby people feel confidence in what we've done, there will not be uh, the kind of vaccination rates that we need to see. And the last words I'll say about that probably have to do with how we intend to get there, um, because um, I, uh, you know, this is a, it's a bit of the reason why it's so important to have a free press. We are we intend to have a free and open exchange of information about this vaccine to the extent possible. We can't we can't give out trade secret information at an advisory committee meeting. Uh, or commercial confidential information, but to the extent that the clinical data are relevant um, to people understanding, to being able to have a window into what the clinical data look like, what the safety data look like, we're very committed that any vaccines we bring forward will go through um, our advisory committee meeting uh, process, if at all possible. And I, I think, um, I always, I always say that, if at all possible, just because we have every intention of bringing um, every one of these uh, uh, to an advisory committee meeting, at least for the first ones to come along. Uh, but my attorneys always tell me that you should never say anything absolutely, um, uh, and they're probably right. Uh, but um, I, I would say that from my perspective, um, any of these, um, from, from my perspective, any of the vaccines that's coming along will be seen by an advisory committee. Um, and that's because it's so critical um, that people be able to see uh, what we're looking at, be able to understand uh, what we're doing, and, and to be able to use this as, an, as an, a teaching moment about um, what 
is you know what we have for vaccines because if 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 people manufacturers the sponsors have done their jobs we should see good efficacy with a defined safety profile and that people should be able to see and balance that then hopefully uh, against um, uh, the, you know the benefits against the risks of a vaccine so I will stop there um, and I am more than happy to to keep taking questions this uh, to make up for the time that I was uh, unfortunately away. And I, I just want to thank you again for your patience with that. Your time is really valuable. And I'm really sorry about uh, that interruption. Okay, well, I'll, I'll make the executive, I'll make the executive decision and forgive you on behalf of all of us. It's, uh, it's fine. Uh, we, we, get, we get your time and your expertise. So we're, we're glad to have you. We do have lots of questions coming in. And I'm going to turn the first one over to Juliet. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Dr. Marks. Um, I wanted to know if you could go into what's actually involved in an inspection um, and if there, if FDA feels like they have enough capacity um, to, to do all of the inspections coming in with the anticipated amount of, of vaccine development at this rate. It's a, it's a great question. So we're gonna have to take the inspections here on a case by case basis. Um, we certainly have inspectors that are willing to go out if need be. Um, in this case, we try, we've tried to taper back on inspections as much as we could because of COVID-19. Um, but in this particular case, we will, we will do what we need to to ensure that our standards for uh, compliance with good manufacturing practices um, uh, are met. Are, are, how do we get there? Sometimes we can do a lot based on paper inspections. Um, we can use other regulatory authorities, if need be, who go in. Um, and we will put boots on the ground, so to speak, and into the facility, um, if need be. I think because of the way the vaccines are coming, are going to come in, I think we are, I'm not particularly worried about our, uh, whether we have enough staff. Um, I am more concerned about how we will get around some of the uh, challenges um, that COVID-19 presents um, uh, in, in actually physically going to places, um, but we're going to work through them. Uh, we, the the FDA has had to work through this on other inspections and we'll work through it on these because it's so critically important. And can I just quickly follow up, what would be the criteria for determining which which facilities get the boots on the ground? Uh, by the way, I'm Juliet Beverly from BrainFacts.org in Washington, D.C. Oh, thanks. So um, what would determine that would be our inspectional history. So we, just to give you an idea, there's probably a variety of things, but among them, when we decide whether or not to inspect a facility, um, it would be just, is there a, a, a history of um, inspections of that facility with similar vaccines? Um, are there any concerns that come up uh, in the, uh, the biologics license or the emergency use authorization file. Um, these are things that we'll be looking at and um, our folks take, I, I will tell you this, uh, the, the biologics quality, they, we take that very seriously. Um, the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research actually was started before the FDA re really related to an issue um, with biologics quality um, in 1901. Uh, a bunch of kids died, 1901, 1902, a bunch of kids died because they got contaminated uh, vaccines or antisera. Um, and that was bad. One, one episode in, in Camden, New Jersey, the other in St. Louis. Um, and that led to uh, the Biologics Control Act of 1902, um, which was really a lot about the manufacturing issue. So long way of saying we take manufacturing seriously. <laughs> Hi, Adriana Rodriguez from USA Today. Thank you for the presentation and thank you for taking the time to take our questions. Um, in terms of vaccine acceptance, um, the fact that some people are hesitant to take one because of the speed or the perception of speed and therefore the perception of um, being less effective. Um, are you guys taking that acceptance or hesitancy to accept that um, into the calculation of doing an EUA? So, excellent question. Um, the issue here is that um, we, we, we are thinking about that. The, the, there, does, there does have to be a balance here, right? Because we have to balance the need to see a, a biologist license application has 
as I was saying to myself, because I wasn't transmitting to you, um, thousands and thousands of pages with a lot of different analyses, many of which will not be directly relevant um, for a decision about whether or not to make the vaccine available. To wait several months potentially for that formatting to occur while people continue to get COVID-19 um, is a real concern um, for us. So we're thinking, are you there? Yes, we're here. Okay, sorry. Um, uh, our, the, the, we're, we're thinking that we would want to see the endpoints and, and all of the data that we would normally want to see as part of the primary analysis, but we wouldn't work stand on ceremony presented in the normal format of a common technical document. So point is really well taken here. And I think that's why it's really critical to us that we have that advisory committee meeting so that people can see that it's not like there's a fast one that's getting pulled, that what people will see is that all of the normal stuff that would be there and an advisory committee meeting after the submission of a BLA will be open uh, and, and, and seen by the public. Thank you. Okay, next question to uh, Kira. Hi, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, my name is Kira, I'm from Leaps Mag. My question is about herd immunity. So if the vaccine can only prevent moderate to severe disease and not mild or asymptomatic disease, and thus people with the vaccine could still shed the virus and transmit it, how can the vaccine contribute to the population gaining herd immunity? So another wonderful question. Yeah, that is a big problem. And that is one of our concerns. Um, and we will be looking very closely at vaccines. It may be that certain vaccines, um, there, it, it, it may be no vaccine is absolutely perfect. You could probably accept a certain amount of that. But if you have a vaccine that essentially, um, that essentially just creates more asymptomatic carriers, we'd have to look very closely about whether that is a safe vaccine to deploy um, in certain circumstances. It might be that you could imagine that that type of a vaccine could be appropriate for certain populations. Um, but, um, and, and you know, you, I, you, can, you could imagine tailoring it for um, a, a closed population or something in some place. But your point is extremely well taken that for the general population, one really needs a vaccine that not only uh, prevents an individual from getting disease, um, but that also um, uh, prevents uh, the spread of disease. Again, we, we, we don't think it's a good idea in the general population to, to create more asymptomatic carriers, which is what you're talking about. And that's, that's something we'll be looking, about, looking for on these vaccines. It's one of the reasons why um, for um, the vaccines, one of the endpoints in, in many of the trials is actually nasal carriage. Okay. Okay. Uh, next question to Umer. Hi, Dr. Marks. Thank you again for the presentation. My name is Umer Irfan, and I'm a staff writer at Vox. Uh, the company Pfizer just announced uh, they published the results from a phase one, phase two trial today, but they actually announced those results at the beginning of July in a press release. And I'm kind of wondering uh, with companies, with private companies that have a profit incentive, there does seem to be a motivation to sort of juice the results or at least kind of uh, play up the, their early findings. And I'm wondering to what extent that's a concern for you, especially given the importance of public perception and public confidence in uh, deploying a vaccine. Uh, let me stop this noise. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, the issue there is spot on. I'm not sure that all of this noise that we're hearing uh, from all of the companies is really all that helpful. Um, it just seems like it adds to the, uh, you know, it, uh, it makes us happy. Oh, there's a, there's a, a, a vaccine that has, you know, immunogenicity. Um, but just like you shouldn't read everything, uh, you, you shouldn't believe everything you read in the newspapers, you shouldn't believe everything you read in the press releases um, with the spin. Um, uh, I, uh, we take these, I think they're encouraging. 
Um, I do, uh, you, as you obviously in, in, inferred by what you said, um, I would not be being hip if I didn't realize that this is a stock price issue, uh, whether, you're, um, whether you're Pfizer or whether you're one of the other companies that are in development, and they, they do this for that purpose. Um, at the end of the day at FDA, we want to see the real data, uh, and that's what's going to be important. Um, uh, and I, I, you know, I, I'll, I'll just give you my perspective as a scientist that, you know, we know that many things don't make it past phase one into ultimately into licensure. So it, it won't, you know, phase one data is encouraging. It's, you know, we take it for that, but it's taken with a grain of salt, probably a grain of like kosher salt, you know, those are kind of, or, 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 or larger, large grain of salt. Understood, thank you. Okay, um, next question to Taryn. Hi, thank you so much for your time. I'm Taryn Manto, I'm a reporter at the NPR and PBS station in San Diego. I wanted to ask about, um, on your slide, you said the FDA is encouraging enrollment of racial ethnic minorities. Can you be more clear if or how um, you're supporting and facilitating that? I know of a trial site here in San Diego and it seems like often that responsibility is pushed off to a community-based organizing group or a community clinic here. And I'm trying to see if there's more of a, um, a grander effort or guideline to, to accomplish that. Yeah, it's a very, another good question. We at FDA don't, we don't have the authority to make a requirement, okay? We will ultimately label a vaccine based on the population in which it's studied. And that said, that's why our guidance is really um, encouraging people very strongly in that regard. I can tell you that when I have conversations uh, with representatives from vaccine companies, um, I make it a point uh, to uh, help people understand the uh, uh, racial and ethnic diversity of our country and understand that um, that is really important um, as we're um, enrolling patients. Um, uh, I've at least initial reports of what I've heard for some enrollment is, been, is that uh, in some cases it's going better than others, but uh, in terms of getting to that diversity, but I, I believe that efforts are being made and we'll continue to encourage them. Could I just ask a quick follow-up? I'm just wondering if you know of any recruitment strategies um, or, or instances um, of how that, that recruitment went well to get a diverse pool. Uh, I don't know in this particular vaccine trial, I know in my past experience, both in industry and at FDA, that um, oftentimes uh, when people have wanted to get um, uh, minorities uh, of the population involved in things, they have gone to local community organizations um, to help with that, whether they be uh, 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 secular um, or sectarian, um, but, you know, whether they be churches or, or just other community groups, um, uh, to, uh, to help people uh, feel comfortable um, with the, uh, the clinical trials, because it is a little daunting if people are not familiar with what these trials are about. So I think that's helpful. Okay, next question to Wait. Hi, Wade Gibbs in Seattle. I'm reporting for Scientific American. I want to follow up on Juliet's question about GMP licensing and drill into that a bit. You mentioned looking at the history of a facility, but for these mRNA vaccines, uh, because they are first of a kind, there is very scant manufacturing capacity for these kind of things. So we're going to have to be crash building new plants if we're going to be mass producing these. What does the GMP licensing inspection and certification process look for that? And how long does it take? Uh, so, you know, I, 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 our inspectors, when they go on an inspection, generally spend uh, a, a week to two weeks at a facility, depending on what they find. Um, and that will be built in. And, and, and how we do this exactly, I can't tell you exactly how we will make that happen in COVID times, because will depend on the location of the facility. Um, but we understand that we have to build this in to any review process for any vaccine and, and uh, that that will be clear thanks okay um, next question to Andrew hi dr. Marks Andrew Dunn from business Insider 
I was wondering when you look at the pipeline of sort of vaccine targets, they all seem to be coalescing around the spike protein. There's a variety of different modalities, but everyone has the same target. Um, are you concerned about that as all as far as if that's not sufficient, especially think about durability of immune response and some research has shown the vast majority of T cell responses seem to be um, outside the spike protein. Are you concerned about that at all that the 155 next vaccines are also targeting the spike protein? So um, I, I agree, and that's why we, uh, we encourage diversity in approach. I, I mean, we, we don't bring products in ourselves, right? But we, we have encouraged, at least when I'm out there, I'm encouraging people with other approaches. There are, there are vaccines that are trying to use other approaches. Um, uh, some of them are not being studied in the United States. Some of them are being studied elsewhere. Um, but I think it is important to have a, you know, this is such a critically important thing that we get to a vaccine here, that it's good to have people um, with backups to backups. And so I think we're, we continue to follow all of the diverse approaches um, uh, without dismissing any, um, because you're right, we've put a lot of, bat I mean, we, we, we put a lot of eggs in the, S pro the, the spike protein uh, basket. Okay, next question to um, uh, Jillian. Hi, Dr. Marks. This, uh, I'm Jillian Mooney from Healthline News. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. This was incredibly helpful. I wonder if you could kind of go through the timeline um, that you might expect. I'm just wondering that if we have phase three studies where people are getting two doses, how long do you wait to kind of see if those doses are effective or, or how long, for, how, what's the timeline that you would want to see um, to, to make sure that uh, people are exposed to the virus and you can actually see if the vaccine is, is uh, doing anything? Yeah, so that's, that's actually a, a great question because it's actually individual trial and individual epidemiology um, specific. So the trials have based on, are based on they need to see a certain number of events in people enrolled. And so they, they've calculated the size of the trials they need to enroll to get there. Um, and it brings up a really good question because it's possible if there's enough COVID-19 circulating that they could get to uh, a sufficient number of events to figure out that the vaccine is effective in you know, two months time, possibly. I, that's hypothetical. I'm not, I'm not saying that's what it will be. It's, it's just a possibility. The issue then will be to make sure that we'll have to very carefully look is to make sure we're comfortable with the total duration of safety data that we have um, that are behind that, um, uh, behind that, uh, that two months, whether, because there's usually going to be more time uh, for participants. So we'll have to look carefully. And that's going to be an, a case-by-case -case, um, uh, evaluation. But this is an, th these trials are generally being event-driven, which is they're looking for a certain number of events. Generally, for the si these size trials, um, they're generally looking for 140 to 150 events um, before they can uh, break uh, and do an analysis. Um, some are doing interim analyses after 70 or 80 events um, to show whether they have efficacy. And, and it probably to get there, again, total ballpark it, given where we are right now, um, it, it could be you know, somewhere between two months to get to an interim analysis, four months to get to a final analysis. But again, it, that's give or take a fair amount because it all depends on the ongoing epidemiology of COVID-19. Hi, uh, my name is Hannah Weinberger. I'm with CrossCut in Seattle. Um, I, I don't want to harp too much on emergency author, uh, use authorizations, but um, you know, in, in addition to the warp speed perception of the public, um, I'm wondering how the experience with the emergency use authorization of hydroxychloroquine um, is infecting, uh, is affecting uh, conversations within the FDA about, um, you know, public perception of emergency use authorizations and how that would affect the populations that may be selected for them first. Like, ha is it more difficult to talk about those now because of that experience, not just public perception? Yeah, I, I, I would just say, I, I, rather than talking about that specific uh, instance, I would say that um, I think our totality of experience is that we have to be careful here with vaccines in general. Um, vaccines compared to therapeutics have, um, the, the bar is just fundamentally different in many ways because we give therapeutics to people 
with a disease um, who oftentimes might be dying of that disease, um, uh, the benefit risk calculation uh, may be um, quite different than in the case of vaccines where we're generally giving them to healthy people um, where the expectation uh, is that they're not gonna have side effects. People get annoyed when they, even they get a, a, a hot red arm after a vaccine. Um, uh, for any of you who've had both of the, uh, of, of the uh, vaccine for shingles, you'll know that after the second dose, you generally have a pretty painful arm uh, in about half of the people who get it. So um, people don't like those things. So we, we understand that if there are more serious things, uh, that would be an issue. So I think as we think about EUA here, the calculus for a vaccine is going to be different than the calculus for a therapeutic. Um, and if you think that's a way I've tried to kind of sidestep having to say a lot about hydroxychloroquine, I'm trying my best, <laughs> sorry. Thank you. And, and also just to emphasize, you know, how are you thinking about the demographics of people who might be eligible for those, those EUAs knowing what they're up against? Yeah, I, I think, I, I know our commissioner may have said something in this regard. Obviously, we will look at the data to see whether there is a specific population that might benefit from a given vaccine. And could you have a, an emergency use authorization for a specific population? Honestly, I hope that, that at the end of the day, my, my, my preference is that we'll get to a place where if we have an emergency use authorization, um, it would be for uh, the most general population possible, um, save perhaps we will have to deal with the issue of getting to younger pediatric patients where the data may take a little longer to come in. Thank you so much. All right, next question to, um, uh, next question to Sony. Hi, Dr. Marks, thank you so much. Um, Sony Salzman with ABC News. Um, wanted to circle back on the advisory committee um, meetings. Um, you know, is there, I, this is a, I'm being sneaky, two questions in one, but um, is there any situation in which um, there wouldn't be an advisory committee meeting? And like, what would that be? You know, what would that hypothetical scenario be? And then, you know, when it comes to releasing the raw data, will the FDA release all the data it uses to make its decision at the time of EUA to the American public? So let me start with the first. I, I, I would anticipate, I, I, I find it very hard to think of a scenario where we wouldn't have an advisory committee meeting. Uh, even if, I mean, one could say as well, what if the vaccine had 98% efficacy and there were, the side effect profile was such that the worst anyone had in the entire trial was a uh, uh, slight ache in the arm for an hour after the vaccine. Even if we had something like that, I think from the standpoint of helping with vaccine confidence, we'd want to have that advisory committee meeting. So I don't, I don't really see a, I, I don't see a, a, a reason why we would not. Um, again, now in terms of what we would make public, um, I think we would, we would obviously would, would certainly make public the um, aggregate data that we use um, to make our decision. Um, we would encourage the sponsors uh, to make as much uh, information available as possible. Um, there are the issues of trying to, particularly when you're moving quickly, you don't want to accidentally um, release data that could um, identify a person. Um, and even though these are big trials, it, 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 some, sometimes just by knowing the hospital that someone was enrolled at, um, their age, uh, and some of the other demographic information, you can triangulate back. That's actually published. People have been able to triangulate back um, uh, to people. So we, we'd want to make sure that whatever data goes out there protects people. But I think it will be important. Uh, it will be important uh, to, um, uh, to to make sure that we we can release as much as we can. I, I can't I can't tell you exactly how much and and the raw data is something that would have to be redacted um, uh, or would have to be made appropriate so that one couldn't trace it back to an individual. Sorry. Okay, so we have thank you. 
We have less than 10 minutes. Um, we have five or six questions to try to get to, so try to keep these fairly tight and your answers, Dr. Marks, fairly tight. Uh, next question to David. Hi, Dr. Marks, David Lim with Politico here. Um, thanks for taking the time to speak to us today. Um, I just wanna follow up on that question that Sani asked. Um, over the past few weeks, uh, FDA has been going to great lengths to assure the public that you guys will have like the independent uh, the independence to make a new decision as to a vaccine. Um, I saw your recent article in JAMA with, or maybe it was NEDGEM with Commissioner Hahn and Dr. Shaw. Um, could you speak a little bit about what propelled the necessity of that 50% guidance? And then going back to the ADCOM, some people have reported a late October date. Do you expect complete phase three data to be public at that point in time for such a candidate? And if not, does that potentially undercut that pledge to not rush the vaccine? So yeah, a couple, couple things. So to start, the 50%, the, the reason why we put together the, this guidance was to help everyone, get everyone on the same page. There were a lot of different vaccine manufacturers that were coming in, asking us the same question. Um, when, by having a guidance that's out there in the public, everyone knows they're getting the same answer. Um, uh, and that's, that was one of the rationales for that. The other rationale that honestly, uh, I, it, we, we put our marker out there, right? If, if in October or November or December, something comes in with, uh, with much lower efficacy, um, we've already put our marker out there. And um, I think that's a good thing to do um, from the standpoint of saying, hey, you know, we, we, we put, we, we, we thought about this and we picked this 50% for a good reason. Why, why would we use something of lower efficacy? I'm not saying that it's impossible that one could make a case for that, but we thought that a marker would be helpful. And regarding the latter, the latter issue um, uh, of the October advisory committee meeting, we're going to be very flexible about when we hold the advisory committee meeting. I, the, there there are two types of advisory committee meetings. There are advisory committee meetings in which you speak about a specific product, and there you can speak about a, uh, a range of uh, products that might be in development. Um, I think it's possible that um, if there's a vaccine that's ready, uh, we'll be able to evaluate that. If there's not, we might have an advisory committee meeting at some point where um, we discuss the development of the class of vaccines. But um, we will be prepared to be very flexible um, we, we will move to have an advisory committee meeting when we need to, to evaluate a vaccine when it's good and ready, not to rush a vaccine to an advisory committee meeting because we just have a date. Thank you, Dr. Marks, Angela Kimlani from Yahoo Finance. Uh, really quickly, on the mRNA technology, has there been any uh, further discussion or, or, you know, just behind the scenes, could you give us some clarity on what you're looking at in terms of how to bring this new technology to market? All I can say is we are we are looking at leveraging what we knew about using mRNA technologies from other products, um, and we will um, uh, continue to to work forward to make sure that um, when these come forward, they they meet our standards for GMP. That's probably as much as I can go into for that. Hi there, thank you for your presentation and assessment and report on women's health. I'm a freelance journalist. Um, two questions. One is uh, no one, as far as I know, is enrolling pregnant women in their trials, but um, a lot of, you mentioned women of childbearing potential and a lot of healthcare workers and essential workers are in that demographic. Can you talk about what the FDA is looking for data wise with respect to this population, if anyone is tracking them specifically um, or how you'll evaluate safety for this group? And second, um, about right, you mentioned regulatory convergence globally and obviously there are a few countries that have announced um, that they're administering vaccines. Do you know if anyone has visibility into there, those formulations or the, the data, and um, are there any gaps in regulation between countries that concern you? So let me start. The, 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 the first question is, um, we're encouraging uh, the, uh, so, th so it's likely because we're allowing, we're, we're, we're telling sponsors they can allow people who are not on contraception that there will be people who become pregnant. We've encouraged them to have registries of those individuals. My guess is we will get data from those registries, and, it, uh, and at some point, um, uh, depending on the vaccine, one might even anticipate that there could be 
um, a study of the vaccine in a subset of pregnant individuals. So I think that's, that will get us data in pregnancy. Regarding these different uh, formulations of vaccines, um, there is not a lot of insight into uh, what some of these other vaccines are. We know at a high level um, what they are um, uh, from other countries, perhaps China, India, Russia, um, uh, uh, but we'll just, we'll just, you know, those are things where um, I'm not particularly going to lose a lot of sleep because um, a, a vaccine that's in phase one in Russia, um, you know, it, it's kind of like um, my nose is my nose is my nose. It's phase one still, no matter what you call it, it's still my nose. Okay, sorry. Okay, thank you. Okay, next question to Lisa. This is a non-vaccine question, but I'm going to take advantage of your being here to ask you really quickly. So, Harvard, I'm, I'm with the San Jose Mercury News in, in Silicon Valley. Um, Harvard's Michael Minna has been a big advocate of these rapid lateral flow diagnostic tests that are these uh, paper strip pregnancy tests as an alternative to PCR, mm -hmm. and he really feels it's essential to turn the pandemic around. He's been saying the FDA is saying it's unlikely or is really not that interested in the test because the sensitivity is so much lower than the PCR. Do you know anything about that? And maybe you could describe I, I, from the you know, FDA's I, I perspective. Hate you, I hate to cut you off on that one. Yeah. But I, 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 know what the I know what you're talking about, but that's handled by the Center for Devices and Radiologic Health, and I can't comment on it because I won't give you an answer that's meaningful. Okay, thank you. Hi, Emily Mullen with one zero. Um, in phase one and phase two trials, we've seen a not insignificant number of mild and moderate side effects of participants. And I was wondering if those were in line with what you expected to see and what sorts of side effects would the, uh, would the FDA be willing to accept for a, a vaccine? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, uh, you know, it, the, the, sides, the side effects that have, have happened with nucleic acid vaccines have been reported in the past with other nucleic acid vaccines that have been in development. Um, whether we expected this many, I can't say yes or no, but what I can say is that um, what will really matter is whether there's a mitigation plan that can reduce um, those, like sometimes, uh, you know, you can, if, if you have headache as a side effect of a vaccine, you can ask people to take uh, acetaminophen, um, uh, better known as Tylenol, um, or ibuprofen um, before or just after to try to deal with those. Um, we, what we would really not want to see are more significant things. I mean, for instance, incapacitating headache would be a problem. Uh, uh, you know, if somebody had such a bad headache after they got the vaccine that they couldn't drive their car home, that would be a problem. Um, so we'd be looking for magnitude. So, so minor, we could affect, we could potentially accept, again, it's a benefit risk thing that would be discussed at an advisory committee meeting. We could potentially accept a, a reasonably larger number of people having a very mild side effect. That might be more acceptable than a smaller population of people having a pretty significant side effect um, that might be bordering on incapacitating, even if it went away after you know, a certain other period of time. Okay, and final question to Mary. Great. Um, hello, Dr. Marks, Mary Hines, Las Vegas Review Journal. I'm seeking a couple clarifications. I'm wondering, what is your best estimate of when the first doses of an effective vaccine could be made available to the public? That's one. And I'm wondering what, in this instance, 50% efficacy means. Um, if, if in light of the concern that in, by uh, eliminating severe and moderate disease, you create a lot of asymptomatic carriers. So what, is, what does that mean then? So let me just take the second part. This will, what your second question has to do with really how effective the vaccine is overall at both preventing disease and at preventing carriage of the, of the virus. If you have a 50% efficacy in both and, and, and we've asked people to look at both aspects. If you have 50% efficacy at both uh, clearing, uh, in other words, if 50% if of people don't get COVID-19, severe COVID, and they also completely clear um, the virus from their nares, um, that's a, a pretty good vaccine. It may be that we won't get that perfect perfection, so we'll have to see how far off um, from that um, uh, perfection in terms of clearance of, I'm talking about clearance from the na nasal passages. It may be that 
instead of um, every 100% of the 50%, it could be 80% of the 50%. Um, and we'll just have to take that um, as it goes. And regarding your second, your first question um, is, um, Madam Olga's is down the street from my house and I'll go to her and ask her, uh, her to look in her crystal ball. Um, but um, my guess is that the earliest is gonna be sometime uh, is if I had to take a wild guess, we're, we're looking at things probably um, in late fall at the very earliest, but I don't know. I, I, I say that with, again, now I'm not saying it with a grain of salt. I'm saying it with a, a probably several pounds of salt. What's a more realistic estimate then? You know, Dr. Fauci, I think, is, has said some reasonable things. I mean, I, I think, I, I don't know what we can say is reasonable because it's, it'll be ready when it's ready. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the time range probably spans from uh, sometime in, uh, in, in, in probably the earliest would be something mid-fall to the latest sometime in, in the first part of, of 2021. So I think, I, I think that's when the, the scope of when we'll see things. And it's very hard. The reason why it's so hard, I'm not trying to be flip about forecasting. The problem here in forecasting is that there are so many variables that, um, that are going on here. There's the rate of enrollment of the trials. There's the amount of COVID-19 that's circulating where the enrollment is. Um, there's the actual efficacy of the vaccine. There's the nature of the participants being enrolled. And so it's just really hard to know because these are event driven. So I mean, could you get really lucky? I mean, I just, to be honest, could someone get really lucky, have, you know, enroll people really fast in an area where there's a real lot of COVID-19, get to their events really fast? Um, it's possible. That could, that could, that's how you get to this earlier time point. On the other hand, the, the more, I think probably the more realistic scenario is it'll be something less than that. And so it, it'll probably be a little bit later. Sorry, I can't give you a better, um, uh, a better, uh, a, a better estimate there. Thank you.